Thanks for joining us inside the Dancer's Studio, where we bring listeners like you closer to the creative process. Inside the Dancer's Studio is a program of the National Center for Choreography at the University of Akron as part of our Ideas in Motion initiative. This episode was recorded in the presence of a virtual audience in the winter of 2022. Today, we join Christy Bolingbroke, our Executive Artistic Director, in conversation with Seattle-based choreographer, director, and educator, Kate Wallach. Named one of Dance Magazine's 25 to Watch, her work has been presented nationally and internationally by venues including On the Boards, Seattle Art Museum, Pacific Northwest Ballet, Walker Art Center, Mass Mocha, and the Joyce Theater. In 2010, she founded an all-abilities, community-focused class called Dance Church, which, during the pandemic, gained traction as an online streaming platform and received attention from Wired, Vanity Fair, and the LA Times. So, Kate, how, or sometimes it's a question of when, did you know that you wanted to be a choreographer? Was it a decision? Wow. Um, So, I... I guess like I have, I've always made dances. My, my mom ran a daycare out of my basement and I feel like my earliest dances were like with the daycare kids, um, being like, I want to put on a show and I also want to be the director of that show. (laughs) Um, so I definitely, you know, I think maybe started my early onset choreographic career making dances to Britney Spears, um, on daycare kids, but I guess, you know, when I, when I really began, like graduated from college and went to enter the field, I just, I, I, I didn't really have like the fire under my ass to like go audition to be in a dance company. Like there was something else that was pulling me to create. And, um, it was sort of then when I made the decision, like, I just, I think I want to make work. Like I want to, I want to be in a dance studio and figure out what's going on in my life and what's going on in the world around me and just sort of take that in. Um, and so I started, I started researching, I started figuring out what my body was trying to do and say and sort of unfold. And, um, and the dances just, sort of started to get made in that way. I love that. Well, and, and also the clarity that you can recall, even as a child directing people and, and if there's anything from my own observation of your work now, is there still is that spirit in everything that you do of let's put on a show. Right. Like that, that has such great sense of fun and play. Um, But you were talking about like thinking of, you know, how to process the world and who you are. So can you talk a little bit more about, so like, where do you begin in making a dance? Is there a point of inspiration or like a consistent way that you start? I've actually been thinking about this a lot lately because when I first like started my career, um, you know, on the other side of education, I, I just, everything always started in my body. Like my, something was going on in my body. I didn't really know what was going on, but I had this like deep guttural desire to like you know, untangle it and be in a dance studio and research it and figure it out. And, you know, the, the pieces, the works, the sort of impetus, the, the, the dancers in the room with me always sort of spawned from that place. Um, and as, you know, I got more opportunities or was applying for festivals, et cetera, um, eventually that sort of shifted where like a commission would come first or the idea would come first rather than it coming from my body. Mm -hmm. Um, and now being, you know, making, I've, I think I've made five evening length works now. Um, I'm, I'm sort of in this place right now where I feel like I'm kind of going back to the beginning, like the dances, the dances inside of me and, you know, the commission, is not necessarily there right at this exact moment. Like I'm not, I'm not like searching for the opportunity to put the dance on a proscenium stage. And because of that, I, my body is speaking to me in this like really deep way. So, um, 
I would say that the dances, the dances come from, from me, what's happening in the world, my body, um, what conversations I'm seeing and existing in, you know, the people around me, whether that be dancers, friends, colleagues, um, people in the field, or, you know, what, where the sort of energy that the world is carrying, um, all of that sort of environment, um, Mm. is, um, the thing that sort of like affects me three-dimensionally, multimodally, you know? Oh yeah. With that in mind, the uh, energy is such a great use of term because I was also reflecting on a couple of those evening length works that um, music or sound has had a really big deciding factor. I'm thinking of from my, my experience uh, seeing film of uh, industrial ballet, which is sort of like dance show meets rock show. And then you did kind of do a big music rock show when you collaborated with Perfume Genius. So how would you reflect and describe your relationship to oh, sound? I love that question. Um, I, I mean, I love music. I, um, I was just talking to two of my collaborators and colleagues, um, Thomas House and Lavinia Vago, about this. Um, because we were like, what came first, dance or music? And like, we were really like trying to like distinguish like what came first. And we're like, they just came together. Like music lives in the body, like, Mm. um, and the body generates sound, you know? And so um, I think just like growing up, like I always, like, I just, you know, whether it was pop music, rock music, metal music, um, now, um, you know, rave music, um, dance music. Uh, I, 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 I just, li- I, I listen to music. And so when it came time to make dances, um, whether that was making a dance on something that existed already, um, eventually I got to this place where I was like, I, I want to make like original work obviously. And so it just was, a natural thing to be like, I don't like, I want to make, make something that exists beyond me, beyond something that already is out there in the world. And so, um, every work that I've ever made for the most part has always, I've always worked with original musicians or like composers on the creation, like the idea of like having Mm. nothing and creating something, you know? Um, and, uh, so, they always were born together. They came, the, the creation existed beyond something that was already living in the world. That said now, you know, with dance church and my, my work there, it's really interesting because like we work with a lot of mu- music that already exists in the world, you know, and are still creating this energy mm-hmm. that, um, you know, music's an entry point. People love pop music. People love like the radio and, um, I think like with dance church, it's an opportunity to be music is an entry point for people. You know, they may not understand what the dance is doing or saying, but the music ignites a certain sense of feeling in, in the body and a big part of dance church, like truly like dance church would be nothing without the music, you know? Um, So yeah, there's, There's something in that, um, both the dance church experience, but then also I thank you for sharing that, you know, conversation with, with both Tommy and Lavi about, um, you know, that they came together at the same time. I'm compelled to share, if you haven't already seen it, the David Byrne Talking Heads documentary, Stop Making Sense from the 80s. And that is... Um, uh, the concert and series where he very famously performed in this giant oversized suit. And it was quirky and weird and think about the fashion of the 80s. And in the special features, when interviewed and asked, like, what's with the suit? Why this weird costume piece? And he says, because sometimes the body gets something before the head. And I wanted to reflect that, that the body is this oversized sort of conduit for ideas and information. And so, yeah, I wanted to share that, take that back to the team. 
Um, and of course, then it, it resonates with di- what dance church is. From my own experience, taking dance church too, we are, are following the leader and that sets this mood and arc and tone and it's a dialogue. You, you acknowledge some of your longtime collaborators and dancers. Um, we do have some, you know, budding dancers who may graduate and want to work out in the world. What do you look for? in a dancer? Um, that's a great question. I Relationships are everything. Like I, um, when I think about looking for a dancer, like it, it I, I'm not necessarily looking for a dancer. I'm looking for a person, <laughs> you know, like a person to have a relationship mm-hmm. with. Um, mm-hmm. We, we talk a lot about the concept of like dance thinkers. So um, dancers who are like in the world, living in the world, identifying as a dance artist, being like, this is my medium. This is my form. This is how my body sees and experiences the world. And to, to sort of, you know, be inspired and, and find people like that, that, um, that are like walking through the world as like an individual, as a person, as someone who sees and like takes in all of that through the lens of the body and outputs it through the lens of the body. But um, like, I, I do not see that as being technique or being like aesthetic or being like lines or forms, you know, like I see that as being like mind, you know, mind energy. Mm. I, I have this concept that I talk about called one, two, and three. And one is the, the idea of the body Two is the sort of relational or energetic space. And three is more of the visionary conceptual space. Even if like those three things in an individual are just a seed and haven't even been realized, like you can tell when someone has all three of those things, you know? And so, um, I try to energetically find people who have that. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I, I love that. And the very idea that it's not just a question of technique is exactly, I think, at the heart of why we decided to call this particular teaching series that you've been working with students this past week, 21st mm-hmm. Century Dance Practices, right? Like so much of the 20th century really centered codified techniques. You were a ballet dancer, a Horton dancer, a Limone, a Cunningham, a Graham. Um, And those things are still a part of our foundation, but it's a little bit like what's next. And so I'm, I'm curious how you would define virtuosity Art, artistic virtuosity. Cause I think that's something that people mourn a little bit. It, you know, they, they yeah. don't want to lose the technique. It's fun yeah. to, to kick your leg really high. It's fun to jump really high. So how would you define virtuosity as a 21st yeah, century? It's interesting, dance maker? you know, just like thinking about those containers that existed or that sort of proceed like where we are now, right. Cunningham, or in ballet, like those containers oftentimes ask people to drop their shit at the door for like a better term, you know, and it was kind of like, come in and now you're inside of this world. And I've, I've always sort of like countered that. I'm like, actually, what if we like came into the room with all of the shit, (laughs) you know? And I do think that, um, choreography, a dance move in itself is a container, you know, and I think that what makes the the leg hitting someone's head or like dropping to the floor, the leap or the turn or the standing and staring is is not just the container. It's the thing, the person, the energy, the feelings, the, the you know, the identity of the person that lives inside of that container and exudes and radiates all that energy out into the world. And so um, like defining virtuosity, like is discovering that, like finding that, you know, being in, in Mm. rigorous and dedicated to, to the sort of bigger picture mission vision of the person behind the choreography, the person behind the doing the choreography behind kicking the leg in the air and the leg being kicked is just, is just a structure to, 
you know, get Mm -hmm. whatever is being said outside of there. Uh, You know, a writer uses language, like a dancer uses the dance. And so I, um, I think that that to me is, is, um, defining virtuosity. It's having something to say, you know, and, and having, Oh, I, I I love that. Yeah. No, sorry. Did you want to say, finish up? Like, I also know that like virtuosity is like, it's also a skill set, but like, what is that skill set? I think it's really hard to make the work you want to make or say the thing that you truly mean to say, you know, and it takes practice to, to, and time to figure out how to really say that or do that or be that. And so, um, Mm -hmm. I think like the dedication and the rigor to, discovering and figuring out how to actually do that and how to say what you mean and dance what you mean to dance, um, is being a virtuosity artist, you know? It, it, and you brought so much in that, right. That it's more than meeting a deadline is what I'm hearing. You know, it's not just like, I've got a to-do list and I'm going to check, check this off, but it's like, how do you work through it? How, how do you make sense if you're like, Oh, we thought it was this, but now we learned more and we have to go back and remake something. And you also acknowledge, you know, other mediums like writing. And that's one of the things that um, we hope are inside the dancer studio uh, series relates not just to people who are in the dance field, uh, but people who anyone who's had to face the blank page. And uh, you were talking a lot about the labor. And one of the other questions that we have gotten from our students sometimes is like, how do you name something after weeks, months, maybe years of work? And then you have to just put a title on it. How, how do you come up with your titles? Oh God. Titling is like the hardest thing in the world. I <laughs> truly. Yeah. That's pretty universal. Everyone's like, it's, it's the just word. like, it's a stamp. <laughs> it's a definition. Like to me, um, like I mentioned earlier, like creation exists. Like I see creation as existing beyond any one person or any one thing. And so, um, and when I'm generating an identity for a work, um, the title's swirling around in that big pot, you know, whether it's like, how, how do I want to contextualize this, um, to the world? And I think that like, um, sometimes a title can help be an impetus to that contextualization, you know, and at other times, like the title actually needs, needs to, um, like it, it can come later in the process as the work more and more defines itself. And then it, it becomes like the exclamation point or the period, you know, to me, like a work is, mm-hmm. it's so three dimensional, right? Like the branding of it, the design of it, the people of it, the, um, the concepts of it, the, the, the language that sits on top to on top of it or inside of it, the role of a curator or presenter that helps sort of like, um, sort of bring more, more, uh, context to, to the thing. Um, it's kind of like a balance, you know, of being like, what, what does the work need in Mm. order to be packaged up and delivered to people? Um, and so that's how I think about my titles when I'm titling a work. It's like, what does this need right now? Does that make sense? Yeah. It totally does. And then I think one of the other very relatable questions, regardless whether you're a painter or a choreographer or a writer or or anyone who's working on a big project is what do you do if you find yourself in a rut? You know, the, the creative juices aren't coming that day. Maybe you brought in a lot more extra baggage than you normally would. And you just can't move forward with what the task and inquiry is at hand. Do you have any advice for, for getting out of a rut or pushing yes, through? Yes, I think I, so this is just reminding me of one time I was in a rehearsal and it's just like the choreographic problem just like I could not figure out the solution. It was like weeks and weeks and like all of us in the studio, like I was just like, it was like hitting my head against the wall. And I had like a breakdown in the studio. And one of the artists who I was working with at the time was like, 
Kate, I think you need to like come more prepared to, to this space. And I was like, and I was like, in retrospect, like at the time I was like, wait, no, we're like trying to solve this together, you know? But in retrospect, I'm like, I'm like, like, I also understand like why that artist said that, you know, because, uh, I do think that like that container of rehearsal wasn't enough in that moment for solving the choreographic solution or finding the choreographic solution. And so like when I'm in a rut and when I really feel like I'm hitting my head against the wall, like something has to change, like patterns, as soon as you notice patterns, like they Mm. have to be broken. Otherwise, like you, you know, you have to have the awareness that the pattern is happening. And then once you have that awareness, like, like shift it, change it. And so like, that was this moment for me to be like, maybe I'd need to try something different, like do something completely like out of left field, you know, or like really just take like a 90 degree angle shift and turn and just break up that pattern and see what happens. Um, you know, so that's what, that would be my advice. (laughs) Oh, it's beautiful. You know how I feel about habits and patterns because you, you know, you're also one of our creative admin research artists. So we've been talking about breaking administrative patterns. Um, it's a really lo- beautiful idea and invitation to, cause you know, what, what is the, the saying? Like, you know, it's a fool who just does the same things over and over again and yeah. expects different results. So th- that sounds like the definition of a rut to me. I think that you had turned it around. Thank you so much for sharing that very personal experience with us. Um, we have one last question, uh, and it is kind of in a similar sort of vein. Um, I would love to invite you to either pass on what the best piece of advice is that you've ever received or to offer up a piece of advice in your own words to our, you know, other dance makers and people who have creative habits. The, the, the one thing that is coming to my mind that I truly feel like was some of the best advice that I ever got. And it's going to feel not very like artistic, but if you sort of look at it through the lens of, of artistry, I feel like it can, be a huge deal. But, um, I had a friend who was a business owner and she told me she owned like a little restaurant and she was like, um, a juice bar. Actually, (laughs) she was like, Kate, the best business is the business that's already happening. And I think that the reason why, like, I feel like this is great advice for an artist is like, um, things that are already existing in in, like they're happening. Like we are, that is presence to me. Like that concept is like just being fully in tuned and hyper aware and super present, like listening to what people want, listening to what your body wants, listening to what the world wants and making hyperactive choices that are reflecting all of that rather than making choices that are just in the future or making choices that are holding on to the past, you know? Mm. Um, and so if the thing is already happening and you're just on that snowball, that's like falling down a mountain, that's turning into an avalanche, like that is how it will turn into an avalanche, you know, just being inside of it and not trying to make the peace happen, you know, not trying to make your work, like, you know, live on a stage or go on a tour, you know? Um, So that was like a really good um, piece of advice that I got. So I'll leave people with that, I guess. (laughs) And it's beautiful again. Thank you so much for this time, Kate. Thanks to our entire team for pivoting to the virtual space. Stay safe out there. Bye, y'all. Inside the Dancer Studio Lunchtime Talk Series is supported by NCC Akron. The University of Akron, the University of Akron Foundation, and the Mary Schiller Myers Lecture Series in the Arts. Our podcast program is produced by Jennifer Edwards. Ellis Rovin is our composer and editor. Theme music by Flaco Torres. Cover art by Micah Krause. Special thanks to Kat Wentz and the team on the ground in Akron, Ohio. To learn more about NCC Akron, please visit us online at nccakron.org. And follow us on Instagram or Facebook at NCC Akron. 
We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we encourage you to subscribe on your favorite podcast streaming platform by searching for Inside the Dancer's Studio. Please share with your friends, and if you'd like to help get the word out, rate us and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening, and stay curious.